Hello and welcome to the Big Time Strength Podcast, featuring small school strength coaches making the big time where they're at. This week, our host coach, Preston Peterson, brings to you a high school strength coach who is doing it big time in the high school setting. We really appreciate you guys tuning in, and I hope you enjoy this week's show. Hey guys, I'm excited to bring another awesome coach to you this week. Coach Garrett Keith has been the strength and conditioning coach at WCA for 10 years. He is a 1999 graduate of American Christian Academy. After high school, he attended the University of North Alabama, where he was a four-year letter winner and a captain on the football team. Garrett is a certified strength and conditioning specialist through the National Strength and Conditioning Association, a certified underground strength coach through Zach Evanesh's Underground Strength Gym, and a certified physical preparation specialist through Joe DeFranco and Jim Smith. He is also the Alabama State Director for the National High School Strength Coaches Association. He works with all athletic teams at WCA. In this episode, we talk about his journey in strength and conditioning, how he intentionally teaches his core values not only to his students, but everyone he works with, how he programs for athletes at WCA, and some of his go-to resources to continue to be at the top of his game. Check out the show notes for Coach's contact info. He wants to help in any way possible. And as always, please review and share the Big Time Strength Podcast if you enjoy the show. Now let's hear from Coach Garrett Keith. Coach Keith, thanks for taking the time to be on the Big Time Strength Podcast. Let's get things rolling. Can you tell me a little about your background and how you got to where you are now? All right. uh, First of all, thank you for having me on. It's an honor to be on here. I love it. Anytime I get to share uh, my passion and, and what I'm doing in strength and conditioning. Uh, my background, I've been in high school strength and conditioning uh, for 15 years. Most of that time was as a sport coach as well, but uh, the whole time has been with not just football as far as uh, strength and conditioning, but working with all of the athletes. And, and um, that's one of the things that is great about strength and conditioning is getting to work with tons of of uh, high school kids. So 15 years ago, after I graduated from the University of North Alabama, which is a Division II school in Alabama, obviously I I played football there. I went back to my old high school that I I graduated of, and and, uh, my head football coach that I played for was still the head football coach there, and he hired me to come on staff and be the offensive line coach and the string addition coach. And um, I worked with him there for five years, and that was in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And after five years there, him and I both left, and we went to Westminster Christian Academy in Huntsville, Alabama, where I've been for the past 10 years. And he is still here. He's not the head football coach anymore. He's now the head of school. Um, So that was a – Pretty cool deal to watch him move from, you know, head football coach to being the head of school. Um, he's actually probably my best friend as well. He was my head football coach in high school, was my pastor, uh, basically like a second dad to me. So it's pretty pretty neat to be able to have your boss be one of your best friends who actually lives two doors down from me and I'm in my neighborhood. Um, like I said, I've been here for 10 years and, and I'm loving it. That's awesome, Coach. Uh, it's always awesome to be able to work with somebody that uh, you truly, truly enjoy working for and, and being able to, to have that relationship. I just, I imagine it makes your job a lot easier when, when you have somebody that knows kind of what you, you're going for and, and you know what he's going for in that way. Yep. Kind, of, kind of give me a little bit about uh, kind of your culture, maybe your school. Uh, maybe tell us about your population and your schedule at Westminster Christian Academy. Okay, we are a, um, a sorry a covenantal Christian school. Um, we the school has been here since 1964. Um, we're made up of um, we are a Christian school, but it's not uh, denominational. It is held by Westminster Presbyterian Church, but we've got uh, people from every denomination as far as enrolled in school and teaching in the school. We have a wide array of sports and and athletics and extracurricular activities we are a 3a school which in alabama there's seven classifications so we're kind of lower tier as far as the amount of students that we have we've got i think last year we had 200 227 kids that that participated in athletics 
So that's kind of the dynamics of our school. The the culture of it is uh, we're not we're not the most expensive private school around, so we don't necessarily have the um, probably what a lot of people think of when they think of private schools. Um, we've got a lot of hardworking families that sacrifice to have the part of the school, um, and because of that. We have a real neat partnership with the parents of our athletes and our students, and that's actually one of the main statements that we make about our school, and, and we remind our parents that um, we're a partnership with them. We want the best for their children, and um, that's one of the things I loved about Westminster when I interviewed here was the, the culture of the interaction with parents and, and, and faculty and coaches is that we're all working together for a common goal and we can get on board with each other. So instead of dreading conversations with parents and dreading meetings with parents, we can get excited about it because we know if there's something wrong, we're both there to fix it. Um, there's not, there's not going to be, um, hopefully not going to be pride or arrogance on either side of it. We're going to be there to, to do the best we can for the kids. You know, you talked about the culture of the school and, and kind of the relationship that you guys have with parents. And, and how does that play into your actual program, into your, into your strength and conditioning program, maybe your classes, or, or just in general, just uh, what does that look like? So we've got, I teach a lifetime fitness class, and I've got six periods of it. Uh, one of them is a zero period. I teach from 7.05 to 7.55. And this is the first year that we've had the zero period. And I had a couple faculty members that were not worried, but they were wondering, you know, how many kids are going to sign up for a class that starts at 7 o'clock in the morning when they could be sleeping. And um, I explained to them that, hey, you know, there's a lot of our kids that want to be a part of the program, but they can't because there's, there's a high academic standard at the school and they can't fit it in their schedule, so we want to open it up. And lo and behold, it's my biggest class of the day is the zero period that starts at 7 o'clock. And, you know, that, that puts a toll on parents, too, that, that have kids that they can't drive yet. So that culture of partnership has played a big role in getting kids here, obviously, um, having parents that want to support the program financially. And then as far as the culture in the weight room, it, it, it opens up and, and let the, lets the kids know. It's one more way to let the kids know how much I care about them. I actually was talking to our kids yesterday, and, and like I mentioned to you before we got on the call, this is my first year to not be an on-the-field football coach. So, you know, that's been something that's been a part of my life. Football has been since I was eight years old. So yesterday after school we had a bunch of kids in the weight room, and and I looked at the, the intern that I've got right now, our volunteer. I said, is there anything better than this? And we looked around the room, and there, every rack is filled, and every kid's doing a, a different program based on their needs. And I said, look at all these kids that are just working their tails off, doing the best they can. Nobody's requiring them to be there. They're here because they know they, they're going to get better, and they know there are people here that care about them. So I think that – that all rolls into our culture based on our school's mission and vision. That's really impressive, Coach. The amount of time um, that you're putting in daily, you know, and the amount of, um, you know, just that support that you're giving to all the student athletes, I guarantee, you know, that's why they're flooding in to your 705 class. You know, when you have that, the biggest class of your day, I think that, that speaks volumes to what you're doing. Um, can you kind of tell us, what your, your mission is, what your core values are, what, what are you trying to, to instill in your athletes? All right, so um, I think a big piece of our program, and it's something that I, I've spoken about at a, a couple of different conferences and, and I really enjoy talking about, is our core values. Because that is a part of our character and leadership development program that we instill in our lifetime fitness class, but as well throughout the summer and any time that we're training. And so I explained to the kids, first off, what, what is a value? What, is a, what does core value mean? And that every one of our actions is based off of a value, whether it's the food that we eat, we're, we're going to value either health or taste is going to be the number one thing. And, and obviously, sometimes those two things can, can be the same. But 
um, the time they choose to go to bed, they're either going to value their health and go to bed early, or they're going to value entertainment and stay up and, and watch Netflix or play Fortnite or whatever it is. Um, so we'll go through what a value is, and then we'll go through what our core values are. Like I said, we're a covenantal Christian school, so our number one core value is to be God-centered. And I explained to them that that doesn't mean that we're going to put lifting for Jesus on the back of our shirts, and we're not going to be singing hymnals while we lift. Uh, but what, what it means is that we are lifting and training in a way that is honoring God because he gave us an opportunity and ability and, and the passion to play a sport or to be a part of the, the training program. And when we aren't using that to the best of our ability, then it, it, it's about us. It's about our comfort levels instead of about what God gave us the opportunity to do. And then our second core value is to be consistent. And obviously that means consistently here, consistently um, in tune mentally and, and consistent with our effort outside of the weight room. A third one is accountable, which means we're be, being accountable to each other. We're holding each other accountable. And I, I'll tell them a big part of that is being willing to be held accountable. Because a lot of times, you know, we don't want to be held accountable. It's hard when somebody tells us we're doing the wrong thing, and especially with high school athletes. I, I remember when I was young, I didn't want a coach to tell me I was doing the wrong thing. And it took a lot of growing up through high school and college to be able to understand, hey, they're trying to help me. So instead of being upset and, and a little bit arrogant about it, I need to be humble and listen and be willing to be held accountable. Then we, um, our fourth one is respectful. And I explained to them that doesn't mean you're, you're saying yes, sir, or no, sir. We're, we're in the South, so that's probably already instilled in them by their parents. What it means is that we have a respect for every single person that walks through those weight room doors. But if they're here, it doesn't matter if they can't bench press the bar, if they are just trying to learn how to do push-ups and you're over there bench pressing 315 pounds, and as long as you're both working as hard as you can, they deserve your respect. Um, so we've got things that we do like our PR bell that um, it doesn't matter if you set a record board lift or you set a PR um, or you progress from one block to the other. It, it, we want to we want to respect everybody that's in here working because it takes – a good deal of effort and willingness to, to open yourself up to be in here. And then our last one is efficient. And obviously that's just meaning we're efficient with our time, we're efficient with our movement, we're efficient with the things that we're doing. And, I'll, again, I'll explain to them not only are those core values there for them, they're there for me and anybody that's a volunteer or intern is going to be coaching in our weight room. And so we've got those on the wall. Um, what they mean for a coach and what it means for an athlete written out, and I'll go through it with them. And one of the things that Jeremy Boone challenged me years ago, and he's actually one of the big reasons why he, uh, why we wrote out our core values. I was at a conference, and again, Jeremy Boone with Athlete by Design, incredible guy, incredible speaker, incredible motivator, and man. And um, he, he challenged us. He said, do you have core values? And I'm sitting in the audience, and I'm thinking, well, yeah, I've got core values. And he said, do you have them in your program? I said, of course I do. He said, do your athletes know them? And I said, oh, and it kind of hit me in the gut. So I, I don't guess they do. I kind of talk about them. I try to implement them. But he said, if, they're not, if you're not talking about them, you're not explaining them to your athletes, and you're not having them really talk about them and understand them themselves, then they don't know. If they don't know what the values are, how do you expect them that, to act and perform in the way that you want them to? So Jeremy kind of prodded me to do that. It's been a great thing for our program. And then I was at another conference where he wasn't speaking, but he was there, and, and he, he, we sat down and talked. And he said, Garrett, that's great that you've got the core values. You're talking about them. You're having your kids learn them. But the next step is to have your kids pointing out the kids that are that are examples of those core values. And I'll give you a quick example how that was really powerful for me and our athletes. So after I take a few weeks and go through each core value, because I'll take one a week, I want to overload them with all five of them at once. We'll do one a week. And at the end of it, I'll start pointing out kids that, that they did a great job of embodying those core values. And then after I do that, 
I'll start assigning seniors or, or some of the leaders to point out, okay, next week, Rebecca, you're going to need to lit, you're going to need to tell us who you think was a great uh, embodiment of one of the core values. And so we, we started doing that. And one of my senior leaders, um, I pointed to her and I said, Hey, Rebecca, how, who was a, a great embodiment of the core values this week? And you're expecting her to say one of the good friends or one of the other senior leaders. And she mentioned this freshman's name who you, you could tell never really had any confidence, kind of had that, that kyphotic posture and just shoulders leaning forward, um, drooped over. And when she said his name and why he embodied the core value that, that she used, he stood up straight with a smile on his face, and you could just see confidence just ran through his veins at that moment. Um, and it was a really powerful deal. And, and obviously great thanks to Jeremy Boone for his assistance in helping me use those core values in our program. Coach, that was a wealth of information. A ton of stuff that is awesome. I love, uh, I love what you're doing with your core values. And, and what struck me, you know, is, is obviously what Jeremy Boone said, but also what you said, where the core values are no doubt for your students. They're for your student athletes. They're for everyone that's, that's coming through the doors. And, and you said specifically for, for you and your coaching staff and everybody that comes in. And I, I think that's just a big deal. Um, one of the things that we talked about this summer um, with our athletes here at Mount Vernon was just actions, not words. And, and we wanted, we wanted to see that. And, and we can talk about it all day, but the, the reason why I think it's, it's such a big deal that what you're doing is because the, the students, they see how you're living that out. And, and I really, really appreciate you bringing that up and, and telling everybody about that. What are some of the ways that you build team camaraderie and develop leaders? All right, so we use, again, the, uh, I referenced our character and leadership development program. I read a book a few years ago got, called The Hard Hat by Don Gordon, and I recommend this to every coach that, I, that I've talked to in the past few years. Um, and The Hard Hat is a book about a lacrosse player that was at the University of Cornell or was at Cornell, and uh, he died on the field. Um, and his legacy was – is still living on through a lot of special things that, that they do in that program. But his legacy was about being a team, a great teammate and a great leader uh, by his actions, by the, way that, by, <clears throat> by the way that he lived his life. And so we implement that book into our program and through half of a, a nine week session, or sorry, half of a semester, we'll go through those lessons and, They've got a chapter in there called 21 Ways to Be a Great Teammate. And so we'll go through two lessons a week, and I'll, I'll explain to them what the lesson was from the book and then explain to them how that can be seen in their day, daily lives. It's a great kind of tool for them to actually hear those lessons and, and to be challenged by them. Um, and, and the kids know them so much and they, they hear them so much from me that last year when I was giving out our, our yearly Top Cat Award, they were waiting for me to spill out all the hard hat lessons to them because it's something that we talk about all the time and explain to them that being a teammate doesn't mean that, that Jim and Joe are, are playing on the same football team and that's the only reason they're a teammate. If Jim is a football player and, and Kate is a softball player and they're both at Westminster, they're, they're both on the same team. Anybody who walks through our doors at Westminster Christian Academy, we, we should have common goals, and we should have um, a, a teammate atmosphere throughout our whole school. And it doesn't matter if you're an athlete or not. Everybody that puts that W on their chest or got that W on their shorts is a part of our school, and we should be teammates together. And then we'll, we'll take it to a bigger view and say, okay, from a as a believer and then looking at it from the biggest worldview, everybody in this world is our teammate, and we're called to be great teammates to every single person that's walking around, whether they have the same views as us or not. But when you walk out of these doors for the last time, you're not, you're not done being a teammate, whether you ever set foot on an athletic field or not. The person that's sitting beside you in, on the bus or in the subway or, or wherever, they're your teammate. And, and you're called to, to hold them accountable to do the things that, that, that we've talked about. So that's one way that we develop or work to develop leadership and camaraderie. 
a um, couple of other ways. We all of my classes are co-ed, um, and I like to have that mixed group. So even at Iraq, sometimes, and I've talked to coaches who have tried this and it hadn't worked for them, but in our situation, it's worked pretty well. We will have you know uh, two guys and two girls in Iraq at the same time and and performing the same exercises. They may. They may have very different weights, but I've actually had times where I've had girls at Iraq that were squatting more than the guys at Iraq, and that would challenge those guys. But it also let those girls know, hey, strength is not a male-only deal. It, it's about coming in here and doing the best you can, and it doesn't matter if you're a guy or a girl. We're going to work together, and, and we're going to build some camaraderie in here. And then one more way we do that is with uh, our football team in the summer, at the end of the year, we have what we call a wild, wildcat games. And I stole this from one of my buddies, um, Chad Phillips. And we do wildcat games. And we just got done with our ninth year of it. And it's two days of competitions. And we this summer, we just started rolling um, some throughout the summer and doing some competitions. We have a draft at the beginning of the year, probably similar to what a lot of people do. Um, and we take attendance. We you know, have competitions throughout the summer. But the last two days, are they dress up in costumes and have their their team names. And we do two days of just great fun and, and competing. And, and at the end of the two days, we have pizza for everybody and Gatorade. And the only thing that the winner gets is their picture up on the wall in my office. And but they love it and they compete their tails off at it. And uh, I think that's been a great way for our football team to end the summer and roll into the season. And that's something that now that I'm um, not coaching football anymore, I'm looking at how to implement that with our whole school next year and have a, a kind of a similar competition with our Olympic sport group. And I know Fred Eves at the Battleground Academy, uh, who's now the athletic director there, but he used to do a thing called, I think it was the Battle of Franklin. And I've got some notes from him that I'm working on implementing for the next year. That's something that you see it at a program. And when it's implemented well, it's really, really cool to watch. You know, like um, some of the videos that are put out and some of the, the stuff that they do for just the team camaraderie. I, I really like that. And I like how you're, you're talking about trying to get it for every athlete. I w- I'd like to see how you're doing that. Um, I need to pick your brain a little bit more about that later on. Um, sure. One of the things that you said earlier on in the show is you've got about 227 last year is what you had in athletics. So you're working with a decent amount of athletes. What are some of your favorite resources, uh, tools, software, apps, any systems that you use just to optimize your training or workflow? All right. So starting this summer was the first time that I have not been an Excel spreadsheet guy where Everybody had their individualized sheets, and it was based on, obviously, your block regressions and everything else in your your sports. Uh, I had a computer issue last year, and um, last January, I guess it was, and I couldn't print out the sheets one day, and it just it it ruined my whole day, ruined my mentality for that day. Hewitt Tomlin, a team builder, and I talked to him a little bit at a couple of the NHSSTA conferences, and it had already been kind of put in my mind about that, that program, that resource. And so I started talking to them more. And then um, in the summer, we finally kind of bit the bullet, I guess, and became a, a part of the team builder group. And I have completely loved it. It has been an incredible resource for me to maximize our efficiency in the weight room for me to be able to change kids from one block to another to modify their, their program based on you know injuries or based on um, the overuse they may get in the summer if they're playing you know multiple sports and have travel ball. Um, I've been able to change that easily for me to collect data. I just can't emphasize how much I've enjoyed Team Builder at, up to this point. One of the cool things I really loved about it was <clears> – <throat> You know, you, you constantly have athletes that go on vacation during the summer, and you expect them to, and that's part of being a, a, a young person. And I would have kids that would ask, hey, coach, can, can you put together a workout for me? I'm going to be gone 
for a week and then go go to the beach and then you'd have to find out are they gonna, are you going to have weights there are you gonna, what are you going to have at your disposal and so I would print them off the sheet and inevitably I'd get a text halfway through the week they were gone coach I lost that sheet and it would kind of get aggravating but with team builder they have their account information they can have the app on their phone and I can program in their workout and put it into their personal calendar and that kid's never going to not have his phone. I mean, they, they, they don't leave their side. So he can pull up that app, um, the Steam Builder app, log in, and he's got his workout there. And if it's an exercise that maybe he's not familiar with because he's in a different location, so I, I couldn't use the weight progressions that we normally have, I can link a video to it and then just click on the video and see exactly how to do it. And I've got plenty of room to describe the exercise and, it, it helps to keep our athletes accountable. Um, and a big part of it, honestly, was I've been using a another company to do a kind of a daily readiness survey. And there were a couple of things that happened with that company that I wasn't real happy about. Um, and so I was on the NHSSCA conference cruise last year. J.J. Tomlin, who was with Team Builder at the time, was, was there, was my roommate on the cruise, and I was talking to him about the survey, and he said, oh, we've got that. I said, what do you mean you've got that? He said, yeah, we've got an ability to create a survey, so he showed it to me, and, and that was one of the big points for me from a price standpoint, what I was going to be getting with Team Builder um, with, their, with their survey and with all of the services they provide. I just couldn't beat it, and their customer service has been incredible. Hewitt and Luke Green that, that work there have been uh, great resources for me and have done everything they can to help me develop our program using Team Builder. And we've only been on it, like I said, a summer, one summer, and um, it's already been great for us. That's outstanding, Coach. Uh, I'm just pumped about you know everything that you said there. We just started um, last January, and it's I want to echo echo everything that you're saying, man. It's it's something that's kind of a game changer. How have you acquired just additional funding uh, for your department? You know, is that through boosters? You guys do some fundraising. Uh, what's that look like for you? So we have a annual fund at our school that is kind of a based on a one ask, one give. Because for a long time, our parents kind of felt like they were getting nickel and dime with little fundraisers, whether it was coupon books or people selling, you know, baked goods or whatever it was for different organizations. At, at our school so we started doing that and that kind of cut down on what you can do fundraising wise so our annual fund when people give to it they can declare okay this is for the weight room this is for baseball this is for football this is for performing arts or whatever they can just go into the general fund and let our administrative team decide where it needs to go but um, so I don't really go out and ask them much but it's been great over the past couple of years. I've had a dad who, of an alumni who bought bought me eight safety squat bars. Um, he heard he heard about how they could be helpful and and why they would be great for our program. And and next thing I know, he's buying me eight safety squat bars, uh, which obviously is a few thousand dollars, which is really awesome. Uh, just this year, or just the past couple of weeks. We had a dad that came in, or a couple of dads that came in, bought, bought us eight iron necks. Um, and everything is eight because we got eight racks in the room. But bought us eight of the iron neck um, devices, which we just got earlier this week and, and are starting to implement with our kids. And obviously, that's a big chunk of money, and we're incredibly grateful for that. I had a dad that he's buying me a Brower timing system. Um, so parents... You know, I mentioned earlier that we're in a partnership with our parents. And even though our, our parents are paying for their children to go to school here, it's amazing to see how they'll buy into the partnership even more and donate money and, and pick up the bill where, where there's things that, that can be greatly used for the students and student athletes here and how they'll continue to chip in. So that's been one, one of the ways, a big way, has been a critical reload program with uh, Mike Buley. I had a couple of friends, Gary Schofield, Tobias Schofield, a couple of other guys that have been using critical reload, and, and I've been using a different kind of 
uh, protein supplement that we offer to our students. It's not paid for by the school or anything like that. It's just one of those things we offer to them. And Critical Reload has been huge for us. Our kids love it. Um, and we've seen some great results because of it. Um, and, and financially, it's been greatly beneficial to our program to where we actually bought all 12 tablets that we bought for using Team Builder was bought with Critical Reload money. Um, so that's been a really big fundraiser for us. And then uh, the last thing that we kind of do is, um, and this one isn't a huge one, but it's a couple couple hundred bucks more in the pot, um, was I love Chipotle. It's probably my favorite quick <laughs> restaurant. And, um, I was there one day, and, and the manager was there, and she said, when are you going to do a fundraising night with us? I said, what are you talking about? She said, we do a spirit night, and 50% of the sales will go back to your school uh, for anybody that says they're with Westminster. So we've done that in the past two years, and, and you know, that's a few hundred dollars that can help to buy new bands or can help to buy little things around the weight room. So that's been a good one, too. Those are great ideas. I think that uh, every coach is looking for some way that they can just – you know, continue to, to invest in their in their program, and and I think you gave some great ideas with that. We're going to switch gears a little bit here and start talking a little bit more about training in general. What is your training okay. philosophy, Coach? Kind of just the overall theme, or, or or what's it look like to be an athlete within your program as it involves training? All right, so we have four training blocks that we use. Um, Block zero, block one, block two, block three. You know, just our progression. And I, I would normally say that every coach there probably has a similar system. New coaches or young coaches out there that um, don't, because when I look back at the training programs that I created when I was first, when I first started being a strength coach, I didn't have proper progressions and regressions. So when I say block zero, one, two, and three. That's just talking about my the athlete's training age um, and their ability levels. And so we operate off a tier system, which for, for me is based off of Joe Ken's tier system. He's been an uh, incredibly big influence in my, my training design and training programming. Um, I've heard him at several different conferences and, and was actually lucky enough to be invited to a small clinic at, at his house and his world headquarters a couple of years ago that was amazing. But um, so we use this tier system, which is basically three days a week of total body lifts. Um, and, and you classify all of your, your lifts and, and your exercises and, and put them in that program based on the, um, the purpose of that day, whether it's a total body day, a lower body day, or an upper body day. So that's kind of how we look at it. Um, as far as the overarching look. So in that tier system, our foundational lift for our lower body is going to be different for a block zero, a block one, a block two, and a block three athlete. And again, for our upper body and our, our, our total body lifts is going to be different based on where that athlete is and what their capabilities are. And we're going to constantly try to progress them. And I'll explain to the kids a lot it's not about that when you come in here you're necessarily trying to get a block three. Yes, eventually you should get there, but the goal is to get a little bit better every day at the block that you're at and progress your ability levels. It kind of goes along with that saying, uh, success is a journey, not a destination. So I'll emphasize to the kid, it's not about being block three. It's about every single day getting a little bit better and we just use the, the tier system to do that what's it look like when you transition a kid uh from a block zero to a block one you talked about ringing a bell um earlier in the show is that kind of is that a big deal for for athletes yeah it is so we've got so our black zero is a body weight only um now i say body weight only they may use some resistance bands for a few different movements in that, but they're not using any um, dumbbells or any barbells or anything in that program. I want to make sure they're moving well first. And, you know, that, that's a common thing that you hear in coaches is move well. One of my big mentors, Gary Schofield, that's what he always talked about was move well, that being his, 
in the second part of his uh, philosophy because number one was do no harm and the next part was move well. And so we've got to move well because I don't want to load dysfunction because when you load dysfunction, you get injury. Um, so I explain to our new parents and new athletes that no matter what you could walk through those doors looking like, you can walk through those doors looking like Hercules. If I've never trained you, you're going to start at block zero. I want to make sure that you can move well and do what I need you to in our program for you to not be injured. So, for example, I had a junior come in this summer that transferred in, and a really good-looking kid, very very strong, and you could tell that he had trained before, and I, I pulled him aside and, because I don't want him to be blindsided with it because a lot of times if a kid's trained somewhere else, they'll come in and they'll think, okay, he's going to throw all the weight on the bar. And so I explained to him, look, we're, you're going to start in this program. It's called Block Zero, and, and I'll let you move through it a little bit faster than normal because I can see that you train, but you will not move through it until I'm satisfied with how you move and how you can perform. And he said, okay, coach. And uh, when you let athletes know your reasoning and what you're going to be doing, they're okay with it. But if you don't, again, communicate with them and explain to them this is why we're doing what we're doing, they're going to get frustrated. So block zero, they they have to be in it. My minimum is, is three weeks, and that's going to be for my more advanced kids that come in and, and are, are pretty good. Most of my kids, if they've been at our school for a while, they're going to be in block zero for about nine weeks at minimum. Um, now, my eighth grade, seventh graders and eighth graders, my middle school PE coaches do a great job of kind of a modified block zero. They're taking them through some isometric holds and eccentric uh, movement that I want them to be really proficient at before they ever get to me. But after they graduate out of block zero, um, again, that's kind of the eye test for me. There's no certain landmark where they have to hit a certain number of push-ups or a certain number of bodyweight squats. I want to be able to look at them and say, you are moving well. You're graduating block one. The so block one, they'll start using dumbbells. And that's when they'll start with a dumbbell bench press. We'll do some dumbbell lift, lift variations, whether it's a, a snatch or a clean, or a clean, a high pull with them. Um, they'll do dumbbell goblet squat. And then I've got certain landmarks that they have to hit before they get to block two. So in block one, a male has to be able to 100 pounds, 100 pound dumbbell for five, and dumbbell bitch press 50s for five, which obviously isn't a huge load, uh, but for some kids it is. Um, and our female dumbbell goblet squat, 70 for five, and dumbbell bench 35s for five. And it it really is a, a big deal when they finally break it because I tell them I have to see it that. It can't just be put down in team builder. I have to see it with my own eyes because I don't want the weight to just get up. I want it to be an efficient movement. Um, so I'll, uh, in the middle of a workout, like this summer, I have 40-something kids in the weight room, and a kid grabbed me and said, Coach, can you watch me? I'm going to try the 50s. And so I go over there and watch him, and, and he already gumb- uh, dumbbell goblet squatted 100 earlier that week. So he does the 50s that day, and, and he hits the 50s. He gets up, he looks at me, I give him a thumbs up and say, go ring the bell. And he'll go over to the bell and he'll ring it twice and, and everybody stops and, and I tell him, give him two claps and a Rick Flair and we'll just be excited for that kid. And again, it doesn't matter if he set a record board record or if he had a PR or moved to a block. Man, if you ring that bell, it, it, it signifies something special happened. So then they'll move to block two which is where we'll start implementing the barbell. They'll do a barbell bench press. They'll front squat. <clears throat> front squat, they won't back squat yet. Um, and, again, they'll, like I said, they'll be working through progressions. Instead of doing a full clean, they're just doing a high pull there um, and, and some clean pulls. And then once they can body, take their body weight on a barbell and front squat it for five reps, then I'll move them to block three, which is our um, – we'll back squat there and we'll full clean and, and all that. That's kind of the, the normal, I guess, level where you're trying to get to. And I think those progressions have done a really – one of the best things they've done for me is when we get new kids, whether it's a, a young 
small male athlete or it's a young female athlete that comes to the weight room and they see this, you know, 250 pound bald guy with a beard, um, that, that what some people call an angry resting face, um, they may be intimidated at, at first. They see, you know, all these heavy weights all, all over the place. But then they come in and, hey, we're starting on block zero. Now I just want you to do push ups and, and wall squats and, and use this PVC pipe. Then they, all of a sudden they get a little bit more comfortable. And then after they get a little bit comfortable, they start going, when can I use the barbell? When can I use the dumbbell? And they see it as a, a benefit of, of, man, I want to get to that point. And so, man, I came in and Coach Keith just threw a barbell on my back and made me start squatting. Um, so there's a sense of excitement of getting to move to the next block instead of he's making me do this. That's awesome. I'm sure the culture around that, just the being able to start somewhere and then get to that level three or that block three um, is just an awesome journey for the athlete. When you talk about your program and kind of where you want it to go, what would you say your vision is for the program in like five years? Like what, where do you want to be at and, and what's it going to look like? So from a uh, pragmatic standpoint, I'd love to have a bigger weight room and more racks and turf under the bleachers and, and some velocity-based training tools um, just from a physical standpoint. But from a cultural standpoint, I think just continued growth. Um, being able to see our kids, you know, one of the neat things about high school and, and one of the reasons why I don't ever want to be at a different level, I get asked by, you know, kids consistently who, may, who probably don't understand what we as strength and conditioning coaches enjoy about our, our field. Um, they ask, do you ever want to be at the collegiate level? I said, no, I don't. That's a completely different ball game. Um, I love being where I'm at. I love seeing kids come in. In, in seventh or eighth grade as part of our middle school summer program and progress and see them change from sometimes a, a twerpy little seventh grader to a ninth grader who's starting to come into his own and understand not just how his body works, but how his mind works and how he can influence other people and then turn into a senior who's a leader, who, who's leading other other into their games and into life and getting ready to go out and, and experience life to its fullest. So summer I had um, one of my former athletes volunteered to intern with me, and she is not even in the strength and conditioning field, and she's just a, a brilliant student, but she loved the culture and loved the program so much that she's been here every day this summer for countless hours volunteering her time. And to me, that's what I love seeing. And I've had other athletes, former athletes that have come in and just volunteered their time and wanted to, to add to the program. I think as far as what I want to see in the future, I don't know that there's a lot of difference in what I, what I want to see. I just want to continue to see growth and see kids buy into what we're doing. We have an alumni lift time during the summer um, where I give them about an hour and 15 minutes in between some of my groups where they come in and they lift and, and they get to do their own lifts. I don't program it for them because some of them are collegiate athletes and they need to follow the program that their, their college coach has given them. But I love seeing that group grow. I love it when there's 20 alumni in here lifting during my lunch break and I get to see them again. Um, so I think continuing to grow the relationships with all of my athletes and having them come back and, and want to see what's new in the weight room and see what has developed. That gets me pumped up, Coach. That's a that's an awesome deal. You know, when you're there for the long term, I I really like um, when coaches do that. When they when they see the value in, in building relationships and getting ingrained in the community and, and investing so much like you have, it's it's pretty cool to see. The next thing I want to talk about, and you can kind of talk about. Um, how how you use these resources, but what is your favorite professional development resources? And, and maybe take some time to talk about uh, the National High School Strength Coaches Association. And, and just, uh, you know, that this is how we met, is, is through the national conference with the NHS SCA. And, and I just, I want you to kind of hit on kind of this whole package of how you're learning and how you're growing and some of those resources. All right, so... Um 
tongue in cheek, probably my, my biggest resource is Gary Schofield. Um, Gary is one of the three founders of the NHSSCA along with Fred Ease and, and Kevin Vanderbush. And all three of those guys have had a huge influence on me um, from a professional standpoint. Um, I went and observed Gary and Kevin, or sorry, Gary and Fred before the NHSSCA even started. Um, I'd heard Kevin speak multiple times at conferences and I tried to try to learn from him. And, and all three of those guys were incredibly humble and, and wanted to help as much as possible. Um, and, and then uh, Rich Gray, who, who's, who's our, the NHSSCA uh, executive director, he is, again, a wealth of knowledge who has a background in strength and conditioning. And, um, man, he, he's been incredibly helpful. So from the NHSSCA standpoint, the, the resource page, we've got a professional uh, resource page on our website and pieces of information that the guys are volunteering their programs. They're, they're making videos. They're, they're doing all kinds of stuff. And Tobias Jacoby uh, has done an incredible job of heading that up and creating a, a wealth of information for coaches to go. Because when I first got into strength and conditioning, it, it seemed like nobody wanted to share what they were doing. They would give you the kind of the out, outward, outward piece of their program, but they were, it was like they were hoarding it. Like, I don't want to tell you everything because then you may take it and use it, and, and you'd be just as good as me. Um, but in the past couple of years, you know, my experience, experience with sorry, NHSSCA, everybody is just sharing everything that they're doing. And I think other coaches can be one of our greatest resources. Um, you know, I, I, haven't met, I haven't met a coach at one of our conferences that wasn't willing to tell you everything he was doing in his program and, and share it with you. Um, and, and it's been a really cool thing. One of my other uh, big learning resources, and, and it hasn't necessarily been strength and conditioning related, um, is a podcast. Like there's a podcast called the Focus 3 Podcast with Tim and Brian Knight. Um, this has been great for me from a leadership perspective. And, again, one of, I think, our, our biggest callings as a strength and conditioning coach in the high school field is how we're leading and how we're teaching these young people to lead. Because, yes, you can be born a leader, but that's rare. And every single one of our kids need leadership development. And um, I've really enjoyed their information on their podcast. That's great, Coach. The thing that I was also going to bring up, this is just from hearing from a few of the strength coaches around, is that you might be starting a podcast pretty soon. Is that true? Well, it's not me. Um, the NHSSCA podcast, um, that's one of the things that, that the founding members uh, have talked about doing and doing some webinars. Um, and That's going to be one of the benefits of being a member of the NHSSCA is obviously the, the professional resource page that I mentioned. That's a members-only area. Um, but we want to get the word out. And you know, the motto of the NHSCA is equip, empower, and educate. And we want to do that for every high school coach in the country. And so many times I think people look at our organization and think it's just for strength coaches. But it is an opportunity for every coach that has anything to do with the training of their athletes. So, for instance, in Alabama, there's not a lot of strength coach-only coaches. There are a lot of football coaches, softball coaches, and basketball coaches who run their own training programs for their athletes. And so we have, in October, a family day. Um, we called it a family day last year. We're having that again this year. We're in our state. We're going to be hosting one at Oak Mountain High School, October 27th, where we're going to encourage every single um, coach in the state that has anything to do with their athletes' training to come and learn. And it's going to be a free clinic where it's an opportunity for um, coaches to learn better practices and best practices for training and preparing their athletes. And so the NHSCA podcast 
is going to be another great way because I love listening to podcasts. I listen to them in the car. I listen to them while clean, cleaning the weight room at the end of the day. Um, and I think that's one of the ways that I finally figured out I'm getting old is I don't listen to music in the car anymore. I listen to educational resources like podcasts. And um, I think the NHS, the CA1, if it's, if it's like everything else that has happened with this organization, it's going to be top-notch and, gonna, and there's going to be something that, that everybody will want to be a part of. That's going to be an awesome resource. Uh, I'm really excited to listen and learn and, and just have that much more resources that, you know, after every one of these that I get to interview somebody, I'm, I'm sitting here and I get to take notes, I get to learn, I get to listen, and then it, it just allows me to go back to, to my job and, and, and invest in my student athletes that much more. So I'm excited for that. We're, we're going to finish up the show here with five quick questions. You ready? Yes. Awesome. All right. First one, person that has influenced you the most? Personally, Stephen Hooks, who was my head of school. Professionally, the two Joes and Gary. Joe, the Franco, Joe Ken, Cofield. How about uh, your favorite quote? Favorite quote was from my strength coach in college, Sam Graham. Shout out to Big Daddy Sam Graham, one of the, the most awesome men I know. He said, if you cheat a rep, you'll cheat on your wife. And I believe that, Big Daddy. And uh, he was an awesome guy. Favorite workout playlist? Uh, for my athletes and for me, uh, I've got a playlist on Spotify called Clean School Lifting 1 and 2. And it's basically Christian rap like Andy Minio and Lecrae and Dashi and some of those guys. Very nice. How about uh, you've got 15 minutes to train yourself. What are you doing? I'm going to probably do a countdown. I'm going to use kettlebell swings, a jump rope, and push-ups. And I'm going to count it down. I'll start with like 15 swings, 15 push-ups, approach and count it down all the way to 1-1 one, one, and 10. How about a small school strength coach that is killing it and just deserves a shout-out? And I'm going to cheat and give you two. The first one is Jeremy Evans at the King's Academy in West Palm Beach, Florida. That guy has a wealth of information and knowledge. I met him last year on the NHS SCA cruise. I was able to hear him speak at the Southeast Regional Conference. That guy is amazing. He's got the background um, that, that really gives him a, a great deal of knowledge. He's doing great things for his kids. My second guy is Chad Phillips at Westbrook Christian in Rainbow City, Alabama. I, I don't know that I've ever met a guy that's more passionate about what he does and so and so creative with his athletes. And I guarantee you every one of his kids, if he told them to run through a brick wall, there'd be holes all in that wall because they would tear that thing down. <laughs> that's awesome. Those are, uh, those are a couple of people I'm, I'm definitely going to check out. I appreciate you coming on the show, taking the time out. Um, I know that uh, you're a busy man, you're a family man. Just the willingness to take the time and, and talk to me is, is awesome. And I, I know our listeners will appreciate it too. Coach, I, I really appreciate the, the opportunity to be on here. I'm humbled. I, I've seen and heard some of the guys that you've had on before, and, and I'm honored to be a part of that group. And anything that I can ever do to help any coach out there, I will do everything I can. Um, my emails with this podcast, my phone number is 256-527-9400. If I can ever assist anybody, uh, I love it. I love this field and, and we'll do anything I can to help you. Thank you, Coach. Yeah, like Coach said, we will uh, we'll put his, his contact information in the show notes. Uh, reach out to him. He is, he is a, a helpful dude that, that just wants to help um, everybody he can in the strength and conditioning field and coaching just in general. Thanks again, Coach. All right, thanks. Have a great day. You too.